Hey, hello, and welcome to the show. It is time for John Park's workshop in the Ask an Engineer time slot. Thank you, everyone, for stopping by. Uh, first of all, happy holidays to everyone who celebrated holidays over this holiday season. Uh, a lot of us have been taking time off. I was off for uh, Christmas for a little bit. I'm popping in to do this show. I'll take a couple more days off, and then I'll be back next week uh, with some of the shows that you know and love uh, in their normal time slots. That's right. So I'm going to be doing my Tuesday product pick of the week show next Tuesday, as usual. I didn't do it this past week. Uh, and then I'm going to be doing my workshop show on Thursday. And that is because Lady Ada and Phil are going to be back on Wednesday for show and tell and ask an engineer. Uh, that's what we think is going to happen. Of course, things can change, so be, be prepared in case we uh, shift things around. But the plan, the plan right now is to have PT and Lamore back next Wednesday for show and tell and ask an engineer. Uh, and then I'll be uh, doing my, sh my show, this show, on Thursday. So uh, look forward to that. Everyone's looking forward to that. And looking forward to a new year, of course. Looking forward to 2023. It's exciting to... Uh, to jump in to the new year, uh, and uh, and I hope that it's a good one for all of us. We kind of need it, right? <laughs> It'd be really nice. Um, thank you for people stopping in on the chat. You wonder what is he looking at over there? Uh, here's here's our chat uh, over on Discord, and I've also got an eyeball over on our YouTube chat. So hello uh, for people who stopped by. Hi, Adam Alexander and Devin's workshop and George Graves over in our YouTube, and then you can see who's here in our. Uh, in our Discord chat, and if you want to join that chat, if you're wondering where is all the chatting going on, if you're somewhere like Twitch or Facebook or somewhere where we're not actively monitoring the chat, then you want to head over to our Discord server, and that's at adafru.it slash discord. Look for the live broadcast chat channel, and that's where you see this conversation going on. Uh, so thanks everyone. Thanks for stopping by in there. Uh, yeah, and if you got any thoughts, questions, and things, please, uh, please ask over in the Discord. I'll try to keep an eye on that during the show. Uh, and let's see. The next thing I want to do is mention the store, right? Adafruit has this store. It's how we make money. It's how we pay for all these people and things. And, uh, it's how we get stuff out to you, ship cool stuff out to you, but it's how we pay for designing that stuff and supporting it and writing learn guides and libraries and things. Uh, lots of code, all the examples that we do. That takes a lot of people, uh, a lot of great people. And if you want to head over to the store, you can find great stuff. I'm going to show you a new, new, new product video later featuring Lady Ada and her singing. So that's going to be fun. Uh, and if you want to get some... Uh, Nice, sweet 10% discount when you do head over there to the store. Well, I've got good news for you uh, because I have a coupon code that you can use. If you head on over uh, to Adafruit and you put some stuff in your cart, it needs to be stuff. It can't be conceptual things like software or gift certificates or subscriptions. But if you buy some stuff and you want to get 10% off, then all you need is this coupon code, JAZZHANDS. If you type that in, or if you have your computer set up with optical recognition software that recognizes this motion and types in jazz hands with a hyphen for you in all lowercase, well then, that's awesome. That was really good thinking on your part. 
And that's going to get you 10% off, but most of us will probably just type that in. Jazz hands, jazz, dash, hands. Why? I don't know. It's just what I felt like when I thought, what should today's coupon code be? Jazz hands. Uh, so type that in, and that's going to get you 10% off in our store. Uh, what's that store look like, you may ask? Well, let me pop over there for a real quick second. Uh, I'm going to hit my product link there. Uh, here's the store. Let me hit products. Let me hit... Oh, there's the new products. In fact, uh, how do I get back to the regular shop? There we go. Uh, there's the store, and that has links in there, of course, for the new products, but also some featured stuff and some, uh, some banners on there. You can also go through, uh, through the Learn Guide and look for guides that you like and find some stuff, throw it out in the cart. Uh, and not only can you use that coupon code JAZZHANDS to get your 10% off, but also we have some uh, bonuses at various shipping levels. If you head over to adafruit.com slash free, I'll do that right now, uh, you'll see that you can get a, uh, a free nude, one of our LED flexible noodles at the $99 tier. If you go to 149, you get a free KB 2040 in there and the nude, the stack. If you spend $200 or more, UPS shipping, uh, ground shipping is free. And if you go to the 299 or more, you're going to get a Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. You're going to get the free ground shipping with UPS. You're going to get the KB 2040 keyboard and you're going to get the nude. Uh, so that's going to that's gonna do you well if, you, uh, if you're looking to get a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then you can also stack on top of that your 10% off Discount by using the coupon code. Coupon code being Jazz Hands. Uh, so head on over to the store, get some cool stuff, and I'll show you some of the new products later. Or actually, Lady Ada will in their new, new, new video. Uh, so you can see what new stuff is out, or you can head there right now if you want. But if you want to play along in real time, then uh, then hang on because I'll be playing that video for you in a little bit. Uh, hello, lovely A72 over in the uh, YouTube chat. Thanks for stopping by and saying hi. Uh, also, thanks, DJ Devin3 <laughs> seems to have found a, a rather appropriate uh, Jazz Hands GIF. Let me, let me hover over that. Oh, gosh, here we go. Jazz Hands! Fantastic. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> Some nice found a cool... That's kind of a Jazz Handsy. I like that. All right. Uh, what else have we got? What's happening here? What's new? Um, show and tell. We love to have you come on and talk about stuff. Show us the things you're working on. Show us your projects. Uh, we had a show and tell tonight. It was hosted by Liz. Thank you, Liz, so much for, for hosting the show uh, and the tell. Uh, and who do we have on? Kevin from DigiKey came on to show a personal project he's been working on, which is a bunch of, and I'm talking like 600 NeoPixels to light up his bar area at home, a little home project. Uh, and he showed off using WLED to program them wirelessly. So I think he had a Feather ESP32, one of the, one of the wireless uh, Feathers. I'm not sure which one, uh, but he mentioned Feather. So he probably got a Feather ESP32 S2, I guess, uh, and is able to code it uh, entirely from the web using WLED. Uh, very cool. I know that uh, there's a guide on Learn using WLED that Aaron put up, Fire Pixie. Uh, so go check that out if you want to learn more. But it was really cool. He had underbar lighting. He had a, a wall area where some glasses are and some, some uh, reactive effects based on a microphone as well. So uh, really cool and a really interesting way to code up your LED projects right from your phone and you can pick animations right from some presets as well as get into the deeper into the coding of that if you want to. So really cool looking uh, lighting there in Kevin's bar area. So thanks, thanks for showing that off. It was really neat. Very inspiring. I definitely want to check out WLED. Uh, Noah came on to show his 3D printed owl. He has a, a new design for a really beautiful stylized uh, owl sculpture that has uh, a rotating head and a little um, switch at the bottom for rotating it, and he was able to do some really cool puppeteering uh, based on based on a suggestion from Liz. But it's a print in place, I believe. Uh, multiple parts that that go together lock with a little twist at the bottom, uh, and then when it's put together, you get to uh, puppeteer it. Really gorgeous design, uh, and I believe he said he'd be showing. 
I, I can't remember if he said if he's shared the, the uh, um, files for that yet or if he will. I'm guessing he will if he hasn't already. Uh, next up was Jeff. Jeff came on with this incredibly cool and weird keyboard that I suggested he get and do something with a few months back. I found a, uh, a it was the Atari XEGS system, which was a, a, a game system. There was also an Atari XE home computer. This is in, new info to me uh, that uh, Phil B shared that there were these two similar systems. One, one was a home computer, one was a game system. Uh, but it had a keyboard on it, sort of a rubber dome keyboard, nothing too inspiring as far as the switches go, but it had this big weird off-centered help button, and we wanted to see if he could get the keyboard working and, uh, and add that help button to it, and of course, it's Jepler, he did. He's got it working as a USB keyboard, and he can press that big help button to act as a, uh, as a macro button, so very cool update on that. Um, Paul Cutler just shared a, a update over on the Discord. Thanks, Paul. He said the OWL files are available on printable. So if you, if you want, you can probably check over on our Discord and you will find uh, links to those. Uh, speaking of Paul, Paul came on and showed a practical project that he's been working on, uh, which is using a Feather ESP32, uh, one of, I, I can't remember which one. I'm going to guess S2 again because he said he was coding it over Adafruit IO, but it could be any, any, any of a number of, uh, of different Feather ESPs. Um, and what's the project? Well, he's got hard water where he lives in, in Minnesota somewhere. So he has a whole home water softener. I'm guessing it's a big tank somewhere in the basement or outside, uh, which requires you to fill it with a bunch of salt for the, the uh, softening process to work. And as the salt gets used, the level lowers, and then he forgets he needs to change it, and then he eventually remembers, well, no more, because he's built this project that uses the feather and a time-of-flight distance sensor. So it's going to be able to tell him how far down that salt level's getting, so it'll give him some, uh, some real-time feedback and be able to hook that up with Adafruit I.O. to get some warnings or visualize it on a dashboard. So really cool project that Paul is working on there. Uh, and I'm guessing that's using CircuitPython. Uh, he didn't say, but that's, that's going to be my guess. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Jeff came back on. Jeppler came on to show off a 1979 computer newsletter called TPAL, I think it was. It uh, had a bunch of basic programming examples in it. It was a little sort of zine-style uh, printed newsletter that uh, he thinks his friend picked up at a computer store. Probably not a, uh, even, even something that came in the mail. Uh, just something he went and got at the computer store. So it was kind of nice to see uh, a little historical uh, bit there. And uh, that was our show and tell. So thanks, everyone, for stopping by. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing all of your shows and tells in the new year. So uh, come on by next Wednesday for the first one of 2023. Uh, and let's see what else we got going on here. I did not do a product pick of the week uh, this week because of uh, time off for the holidays, but I'll be back next week with one of those. So stop by on Tuesday at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern, and I'll show off a new product pick and give you a big discount on it. Uh, let's see. Next up, hey, how about uh, let's do a little Circuit Python Parsec? Let me get set up for that. Okay, hold on one second here. Let me get that code in front of me. Remember what we're talking about here. All right, for the CircuitPython Parsec today, I want to show you how you can use a Super Nintendo controller as a input in CircuitPython. Now, this uses the keypad library, and the keypad library can deal with shift registers as well as matrices and other input methods. These Super Nintendo controllers and clones, like the one that we sell in the store, uh, use a shift register. So I'm using the shift register side of the keypad code, and I have it set up so that it just reads each of the different keys on the keypads when I press them, the D-pad here, uh, the select and start button, and even the shoulder buttons. And depending on which one I press, I get a different display here of NeoPixels. 
So the way this works is pretty straightforward. I've set up NeoPixel. Uh, also, I've imported the library for keypad. That's the, the main thing here. I've got a little list of names here. I've set up the keypad object right here. So this is a shift register. Its name is shift K. Uh, and it is keypad.shiftregisterkeys. Then we set up the pins for the clock, the latch, a value to latch, data pin, the key count, how many are on here, uh, and the value when pressed is set to false. So that tells us uh, which direction this is going to go when we press something. Then in the main loop of the code, all I do is say the event is shift k dot events get. So it checks for any events that are happening on the device there. If something gets pressed, then I'm running this little pixel code here and printing things out. Uh, and when something is pressed, it returns the key number, event dot key number, and that's what I can pass to my little um, function that I have here for defining pixel patterns. And so it's really straightforward, very easy to use. You could use this to turn these into USB key presses or for pure microcontroller type of projects here without a computer at all. And so that is how you can use a shift register Super Nintendo controller as input in CircuitPython. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Beep boop boop, beep boop, beep boop. All right, uh, yeah, I was hoping to maybe uh, do some other things on here, like maybe a little Mario animation. I uh, didn't have time this year, but I might come back to this even just for, for fun for my own personal project, because it is a... Uh, uh, a, a tricky thing to deal with these types of controllers if you've ever th taken one apart and thought, hey, maybe I can just read these as inputs. They're not separate individual uh, digital input pin type of output pin types of things uh, per press. It's actually using this little shift register. So uh, Dan Halbert, thank you so much for including that in the keypad library. Makes it very easy to deal with these types of controllers. And uh, just a little bit on, on how this is set up. Uh, if you look here, I've got a Feather RP2040, and I'm using one of the terminal block uh, Feather wings here. And I've got my controller here. I've actually taken off the uh, connector, the SNES-style connector. And you can see here there are five pins that are actually used in that. And I have them wired up, as I showed before, to the uh, clock, latch, data, and the power and ground uh, pins, which are then connected to my feather there. So uh, pretty, pretty easy way to, to connect up one of these controllers. Uh, there's a, there's a close-up of that there. So controller is this black cable, and it actually has five conductors uh, coming off of it that are plugged in there. And then these other ones here are my uh, running to my NeoPixels there. So, boop, 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 boop. Could play a really limited version of Tetris on this, maybe. All right. So, uh, let's see. Let's see if anyone's got any questions over in the chat. Otherwise, uh, we'll move on with no questions. None, none existing yet. Yeah, okay. Do, do, do. All right, so let's jump forward to uh, talking about our... CircuitPython is code plus community. And to me, that means the Python on microcontrollers newsletter. So here is, if you head to adafruitdaily.com, you can subscribe to our Python on microcontrollers newsletter and get all the latest info, all the latest news each week. Uh, it's delivered for free into your mailbox, very low effort. Uh, you can cancel at any time. We promise not to spam you. All you need to do is head to adafruit.daily, sorry, adafruitdaily.com, uh, put in your email address and sign up. Uh, and the newsletter is also accessible just as a web page here at adafruit.daily, sorry, at adafruitdaily.com. Uh, you can click on a link that gives you the latest of the um, Python on microcontrollers uh, newsletter, and I want to talk about a few of the items that caught my eye this week. One is the uh, CircuitPython 8.0.0 Beta 6 has been released, uh, and some of the uh, 
interesting things that come with this release uh, are uh, mentioned in here, including some uh, switches over to the .toml, settings.toml file from the .env. Um, so you can check that and head out to the blog or the GitHub from these links to find out more. Uh, another interesting one, this is actually sort of the road to this being in Python. Uh, Tiny USB has added Bitbang USB host support for RP2040. Uh, and while this is running just in Arduino right now, the hope is, is that this will find its way onto Python soon. And uh, this will include, uh, hopefully, right now I think there's uh, serial and mass storage uh, host capabilities, but hopefully this will also move into some of the other things like USB, HID, um, MIDI, and other things like that. So that's a, just a, a glimpse on the timeline to adding some of this USB host support to RP2040, which is really cool. Uh, there aren't too many microcontrollers out there that allow you to do both a USB uh, a, uh, side and a USB host side, uh, client and host side. TNC 3.6 and TNC 4.0 are the only two I've done it with before. Uh, and those are really hard to find now, so I'd love to have something else that you could plug in a MIDI keyboard or a mouse or whatever you want and still be able to output on the other side. So um, could be really cool. Uh, there's also a link here to head to uh, the Adafruit blog to check out a post from Scott on the uh, upcoming 2023 plans for CircuitPython, and we'll be doing more posts uh, about that, about our plans, and looking for people's uh, both annual wrap-up and, and for people's uh, predictions and hopes for the coming year. Uh, there was also a story in here about uh, Raspberry Pi Foundations uh, saying there probably won't be a Raspberry Pi 5 coming in 2023. They're going to be doing some catch-up on manufacturing and getting, uh, getting some devices out there uh, of existing Pi boards before they move into the Pi Five, so uh, you can click on that link to go to the Tom's Hardware article. There's also an interview here with Evan Upton uh, that you can go and check out from the law, uh, blog or over on YouTube. Uh, a story here about ESP32 GitHub updates are available over the air with MicroPython and MicroGit. So this is something that would allow uh, you to keep an ESP32 device in sync. Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> wow, that was a good one. Pardon me. It's right into the microphone, too, so I probably could have covered that. Sorry about that. Man, that was some sneeze. Uh, so this will allow you to keep your ESP32 devices in sync with a GitHub repository over the air, which is uh, pretty interesting. It allows you to clone an entire MicroPython repo uh, onto a MicroPython microcontroller. Then uh, there were some projects here that caught my eye. There was a really neat-looking... Uh, sort of telepresence remote articulated robot hand project here. Uh, this was programmed in MicroPython and uses some of the Adafruit flex sensors. Uh, if you look at the GIF there, I don't know if that'll play. Uh, probably, oops, now I've done it. You know, let me go back. I don't want to go there. Uh, probably is playing at a sort of a limited frame rate, but you can see there, there are three or four flex sensors on a... Uh, finger-mounted controller, and then there's a robotic hand in the background that's uh, moving to, to keep pace with the, with the flexing of the fingers, which is pretty cool. Uh, and that's using ASP32 uh, as, the, as the microcontroller on there. Uh, some other items that I thought were cool, there was a 3D printed hot air balloon uh, from Geek Mom, I think, right? Yeah, and this uses uh, a little NeoPixel ring, a Zhao ESP32 C3. It has a um, web workflow uh, uh, using the web IDE, and it also has some really cool-looking light pipes on there that, uh, that illuminate. You can follow the link there to Mastodon to find out more. Uh, and then there was also a little section in here on some... Uh, new boards that are out that support CircuitPython, and uh, you can scroll through all these cool uh, projects here, other Python projects, some new products that are CircuitPython capable. Uh, here's the link, uh, or the list, and then a bunch of links to, looks like about a dozen new boards that support CircuitPython, so you can go check that out. 
Uh, and that is the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. So go check that out at adafruitdaily.com. All right, uh, let's see, what else have we got going on here? Uh, hey, everyone loves Adabox, and we are so excited that despite having zero Adaboxes in 2022, we have plans for multiple Adaboxes coming in 2023. Uh, so head over to adabox.com or adafruit.com slash adabox. I think we have that first one. Uh, and go check out the links there. You can sign up. If the list is full, you can get on the waiting list. We are looking forward to bringing some really cool content, cool adaboxes, neat stuff, new products, uh, fun unboxings and videos, projects for you to build with them, all of the usual adabox shenanigans. Really excited to be able to jump back into those next year. So... Thank you so much for your patience on those, and we really hope you uh, are getting excited as we are about the return of Ada Boxes in 2023. Uh, yeah, thank you. George Graves posted over in our YouTube chat. There is at adabox.com. I'm glad I didn't just make that up. You can't just go making stuff up. Uh, so next up, new products. Uh, and we're very excited to have Lady Ada and Phil back for a real genuine new products video. So please take it away, Lady Ada. And it's new products. New, 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 okay. new. It's time for new products. That's Christmas Day Day edition uh, here at my desk with Lady Ada. We'll go through a couple of the new products that we've put in over uh, the last week or two. So let's kick it off. First up, we've got an updated product. This is the IS31FL 3731 uh, PWM LED matrix driver. So this is our Charlie Plex driver. It can drive uh, nine by 16 LEDs because it Charlie Plexes them. Um, we sell the grids as well, um, like LED grids with SMT LEDs. This is the driver board. Also handy if you're just driving like a gigantic LED matrix. Um, this is a very inexpensive way to drive all those LEDs. We've updated it by adding STEM QT connectors because it's uh, all I squared C controllable. Um, so it's otherwise the same pinouts on the top and the left. We just had a little spot on the right, added those um, I squared C ports, and we also updated the silk screen. Next up. Next up, another updated product. Uh, this is the Chronodot from Mace Tech. Uh, this is kind of famous. This is a really early product we used to sell. It's a product number 255, which is many, wow. many, many years ago. Um, and this used to come with a DS3231, uh, which uh, due to the silicon shortage has been totally unavailable. And so you can see here in this image, it now comes with a Max 31. Two eight, sorry, three one three two eight. Uh, we actually covered the three one three two eight, three one three two nine on Iron and PI a couple months ago, if you remember. Um, what's interesting about this chip is it's a, also an ultra precise RTC um, from Maxim. Um, but what's extra interesting is it is pin. Uh, sorry, it's not pin compatible. It is firmware compatible with the DS thirty two thirty one RTC library, um, and so. If you were using the DS3231 and you want to update to this new 31328, um, this board is pretty much drop-in compatible. You can use your old existing code. Um, I think it basically has the same precision. Uh, the one thing that didn't get added um, to the update chip, the 31328, is an EEPROM, which is why there's, if you see at the bottom there, there's a separate uh, I2C EEPROM chip. Um, but it's on the same I2C bus. So it's like a nice little update. And uh, most important, it's available and you can actually buy it, unlike DS3231s, which are tough to get. All right, next up. Next up, we have two new products of the same family. The PCA9546 is a four-channel I2C expander. So this is really handy when you have, say, four, uh, you know, say DS3231s, uh, RTCs, or um, humidity sensors, or accelerometers, or other devices on the I2C bus that use the same I2C address and so you're limited. You can only you know use one per bus, but you want to say control four of them. Um, this is pretty common. People have like you know motor driver maybe, or um, they want multiple accelerometers or multiple gyros. 
um, you know, or multiple uh, humidity or pressure sensors because they want to measure pressure in different locations. So this chip will take one I squared C port in and allow you to select uh, four different outputs by writing the address to the you know the port number you want to route your signal to. I think onto address uh, 70. And the chip itself also has three address pins, so you can change that. If you're like trying to address, you know, chips that use address 70, of course you can change it to be, you know, 71 to 77. Um, and that way you can address multiple chips on the same port. We carry the TCA9548, which is the eight channel version of this chip, um, but maybe you don't need as big a version, you know, you don't need as many ports, you'll need eight, you'll need four, uh, go for it. We also have this chip in a STEMA QT format. Um, so solder free if you have our stomach QT or quick boards, uh, plug and play. And again, it gives you uh, four channel I squared C multiplexing. Um, this board also, in addition to multiplexing, has a three volt level shifter because, you know, maybe you have um, an Arduino Uno on one side that's five volt logic and power and you want to address I squared C devices that use three volt logic and power. So it'll, it'll allow you if you um, go to the back, the one with the quarter. That image, if you see on the back, the V out uh, jumper by default, uh, it uses the same voltage as the input, the V plus. But if you'd like, you can cut and adjust that trace to use three volts, and so it'll do a lot a three volt logic level shift down. Again, this is the four channel version of the eight channel I squared C multiplexer we put in a while ago. So choose which one, either the breadboard version or the STEMI QT version, uh, as you need. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Okay, next up. Next up, more uh, STEMI QT accessories. Uh, this one is going to be very handy for people who want to connect to five volt power or five volt logic I squared T devices on the most common three volt power and logic microcontrollers and microcomputers that are available now. So if you have, you know, old style Arduino Uno and you want to connect to uh, you know, for example, the Sen 55, or there's some, you know, maybe uh, GPIO expanders um, or RTCs or other sensors that use five volt power or five volt logic, uh, you're good to go. But nowadays, a lot of people are using RP2040 Picos or ESP32s or Raspberry Pi computers, or even, uh, you know, NR52 or other modern Arduino compatible or microcontroller boards. They have three volt power, three volt logic, and um, it's not, it, it's pretty common to see downshifters, but upshifters are a little more rare. So this is an upshifter. Uh, you give it three to five volt power and logic in, and there's a switch cap uh, charge pump converter that'll give you 100 milliamp continuous or 250 milliamp peak. Um, it's the AP32, sorry, AP3602A, which we have a data sheet uh, attached, and it'll boost up that power from three to five volts, and it'll shift up the uh, I squared C logic from three to five volts as well. So again, handy, there's a couple sensors and devices we've seen where, um, you know, they, they want five volts because there's a motor in the sensor or there's, uh, you know, it's an old style chip and so it uses five volts, not three volt logic. Um, and you want to uh, connect to that with your modern three volt microcontroller. Um, there's also, uh, if you go to the quarter shot, um, on the back, you'll see there's a V I squared C jumper. Um, if you want to have power be five volt, but the logic level be three volt, you can cut and set that jumper uh, to use the logic, the, keep the I squared C at the same logic level. Don't shift that up. We've seen that in a couple of devices as well, where again, the power is five volts, but the logic level is three. So you can use this board either way. It's also breadboard compatible if you're not using STEMI QT at all, just you know, solder in the header uh, and use it on your favorite breadboard. All right, and the start of the show tonight, besides you, Lady, our team, our customers, our community, everybody who's been helping us out, especially why we took a little bit of time off to bring Kiddo into the world is Scorpio. Kiddo is a Scorpio, so this Scorpio. is... I wanted to make this, uh, get this board out before the end of the yeah. year. Didn't quite get it out for Scorpio season, uh, but that's okay. Pretty um, close. It was pretty close. Uh, and I wanted to get this out before the end of the year. So Scorpio. this, the RP2040 Scorpio board is finally out and available. Uh, it's gonna be in the shop this week. So this is an RP2040, um, and this board is feather shaped. It has all the feather pins that you know and love, but on the end there, there's another two by eight header. Uh, one row is ground, the other is eight contiguous pins connected to uh, the PIO um, um, 
state machine inside and they're contiguous and so they're really good for driving lots of NeoPixels, especially since the RP2040 has uh, 264K of RAM. So it's a ton of RAM. It's got the PIO state machine, which is excellent for driving NeoPixels. Um, it's a you know dual core, so of course you can have all your, in addition to having all your NeoPixels DMA'd, you could have two cores if you want to do extra computation on one core and then blit in the other one and maybe get Wi-Fi data or something and, and, and use that to calculate or, or adjust what the um, graphics being shown on your NeoPixels are. Um, but the RP2040 makes for a perfect NeoPixel driver. And so this board is basically designed specifically for you want a feather, you want an RP2040, you want to drive a ton of NeoPixels, and we've got Arduino and CircuitPython code that does that, again, all with DMA. So you don't have to sit there and like toggle each pin and, you know, hold your processor hostage, um, the RPIO peripheral goes off and does it, and you can uh, you know check when it's done, and then you can compute the next frame of data. So um, it's got USB-C, it's got battery, um, and the important part is on the right-hand side uh, of the board. Sorry. Let's go uh, on the, no, that one. Yeah, right. on the right-hand side of the board. So on the left-hand side, you get like the, you know, the business end, USB-C, battery, the reset button, regulator, battery charging, middle is the RP2040 chip. Um, there's a small NeoPixel on D4 if you want to like, have onboard um, notification to tell you what the status is. There's eight megabytes of flash memory, so you can use that for your program storage, or of course, uh, both in Arduino and CircuitPython, you can put a file system on it if you want to have uh, images, you know, uh, configuration data, um, what have you stored on that flash memory. There's tons of flash memory. There's a boot pin, a boot button for entering into boot mode. That's also available as a user button. Um, I think it's on GPIO 7. Uh, so you can, once the RP2040 is booted, uh, that button becomes a user input button. There's a vertical STEM QT pin. And then below that, you see a chip and some resistor packs. That is the logic level shifter. So um, even though a lot of modern NeoPixel strips are happy with three volt logic, not all of them are, especially if you're giving them 5.5 volts of power. And so there's an onboard logic level shifter that'll take those eight signal pins um, and shift them up. I think it's pins uh, 16 to 23. So those GPIOs get shifted up from three volts to five volts, whatever is on the USB port. And then there's uh, 100 ohm resistors just to kind of reduce any ringing effect, especially with long uh, wires going into your NeoPixels. Um, and then on the back, uh, if you go to the quarter shot, there is, um, if you happen to want to configure it on the back, you can change the V-Logic, the logic level output from five volts to three volts. Say you don't want to drive a uh, five volt uh, signal into something, you're driving non-NeoPixels or maybe something that uh, requires a lower level voltage. And also you can change the direction of that shifter. It's uh, nominally only output, um, but if you want to turn this into say a logic analyzer, you can uh, change the direction to be inputs and it's five volt safe because it's using a five volt safe level shifter. And then um, that signal could come in and you could turn this into say like an eight channel logic analyzer and uh, use some open source software to do so. Um, but we really think this would be great for people making LED art because, um, you know, there's, we've seen a lot of art projects in New York and online where people have, you know, massive displays of NeoPixels. Oftentimes using, unfortunately, chips and microcontrollers are no longer available or they're very hard to get right now, but the RP2040 is really easy to get. Um, so we think using the NeoPixel 8 library that we've got, or you can even, um, because this chip has enough RAM and is pretty fast, you can use the NeoPixel 8 HDR library and that adds dithering um, sub pixel subsampling, which basically means that not only do you get that eight bits per color, 24 bits per pixel color, but you also get another two by do some, doing some temporal dithering. Um, very good for when you're doing gamma correction or you have uh, low brightness LEDs. Um, a lot of people notice that because the LED brightness is linearly PWM'd, but our eyes, you know, kind of are logarithmic, um, LEDs that are at the lower brightness level, um, the brightness shifts change um, more dramatically than at the higher level. With dithering, you, you know, you get an extra couple bits um, it smooths that out and makes it a little bit, um, you know, more of an elegant distribution at the lower brightness levels. All right. And uh, that's Scorpio. That's new products. It's a very happy Scorpion. All right. 
we'll um, we'll see everybody throughout the week. We have a lot of new videos and more planned. We have multiple setups as we do tons of videos, not only for the last week of the year, but as 2023 approaches. So uh, buckle up. There's going to be a lot of hardware, everybody. That's right. Thanks for coming by the new, new, new. New, new, new. Here at my desk. New, 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 new. Awesome. Great to have Lady Ada back with all the new stuff uh, and some really cool stuff. I'm looking forward to that Scorpio too. I saw a lot of people in the chat uh, are excited about that and, and I'm with you on that. Uh, giant, huge strips of, of lots of LEDs looks a lot of fun. Uh, also, questions in the chat. There was a question and I'm not sure. I might need a clarification. Uh, Kayoshi asked, is this ruined? And I'm not sure. Perhaps you're referring to the battery. Uh, if you have torn a wire off of one of those batteries, it can be pretty dicey to, uh, to solder to it. It's a little dangerous, so I'm not going to recommend people try to fix that cell. You might just want to get a new cell. And I'm not sure what's going on with the spool there. It said that you, you've lost the spool end. It must be somewhere, right? It's not infinite, is it? Probably not. All right. Uh, let's see. Then, I think that covers all of those things. I wanted to mention again, since uh, Lady Ada was talking about all those cool new products, that you can get 10% off in the store. So if you want to load up your cart full of lots of that cool new stuff, then add some jazz hands at the end and you'll get 10% off. Jazz-hands is your coupon code today for no particular reason other than I felt like it. And uh, make sure that you... Uh, Make sure that you throw stuff in your cart, not software gift certificates or subscriptions, but actual stuff. And then Jazz Dash Hands will get you the 10% off uh, on your way out. Um, oh, I see. Kayoshi said they pulled out its magnet wire. It's supposed to have a nice tight spool. Uh, yeah, you could probably spool that back on there. I don't see why not. Um, it's pretty easy to spool that kind of wire. The worst thing to try to spool is 3D printer filament. If you've ever had that go bad on you, boy, that's a process of trying to trying to fix a bad spool of, of kinked up printer filament. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, and so, wanted to say where I'm at with some projects. Uh, showed you the 16-step drum sequencer, and I'm working on a guide for that right now. Uh, I'm also midway through building the updated LCARS display, so I'll, I'll be finishing that up in the new year and get a, uh, a guide out for that. Uh, and then there was a, uh, I just wanted to show you, the only thing I had to show you tonight on, over on the workbench is something I uh, introduced, oh no, got to kick this camera, it's gone funny. Um, I introduced this a little while ago, and uh, it was a kit. I hadn't built it yet, but I've got it built now, and I wanted to show you. Let me update one of my camera monitors here real quick so I can see that. Uh, and I'll head over to the workbench. Let's see, where is that view? That'll do it. Uh, so this uh, is an LED lamp board built to look like, oh no, this camera is having problems, isn't it? Okay, I wonder why it's gone a little flaky. Stay, stay awake, camera. Uh, this is a kit I got off Tindy. It's called the Enigma Lamp Board. You can find it. Just search Tindy. Uh, from Hack Modular. And this uh, is meant to look like the... It's designed very similar to the lamp board of an Enigma machine, the top part that, that shows you what your uh, letters are being deciphered as as you enter them in. Um, this one, however, takes voltage, control voltage, to light up the letters. So it's meant to use for things like Eurorack. Um, but I wanted to show you uh, I've got it working just with a Circuit Playground Express here that I have sending out over the DAC, which is the Digital Analog Converter Pin, pin A0 here. Uh, let me turn this on. Oh, it's on. Uh, I have it just sending out voltages which are 
one volt for 12 letters. So over a two volt uh, and, and a little bit range, you can light up letters. So unlike something like a NeoPixel, this is kind of a fun old fashioned throwback way of doing this. The um, circuit chips on here translate voltage into addressing different LEDs on here. And you can see my uh, my calibration is a little bit off, so you'll see some, sometimes it doesn't light the letter it should and it lights multiple letters at once. So I've got a little bit of tuning to do on here as well as what voltages I'm sending. And I had a different reference voltage uh, for the Circuit Playground Express, so it's not quite perfect right now. Uh, but a cool kit, I'd, I'd shown it before, so I won't go into huge detail, but I just want to show you, it was something I finished up, it was something I built for, for fun for myself over the break. Uh, sometimes it's a lot of fun to build a project that I'm not documenting and, uh, and throwing uh, a learn guide together for, so this was just, just selfish fun to, to build that. Uh, but I decided not just to control the lighting as a VU meter style thing for my Eurorack synthesizers, but instead to send it some specific voltages from the Circuit Playground Express. Now, part of the idea is there is it could be a fun way to do something like a puzzle, um, a, a riddle of some kind, a uh, uh, escape room or mystery box kind of thing. Um, and I'll show you in a uh, little bit more the Eurorack fashion, but actually also using Circuit Python. Uh, right here I have one of uh, Todd Kurtz's little modules that he built uh, and you can find it on his GitHub. You can build one of these yourself. He, he gave me this uh, PCB he had built up. He calls this a trinket trigger, and this uses a trinket microcontroller. And it has some capacitive touch pads built into the faceplate here. So if I hover over and get closer and closer to the A pad here, you can see I'm sending voltages which aren't super locked in, right? It's, it's kind of varying the voltages around, um, but that means I can, I can get these fun effects of, of lighting up a whole bunch of letters at once as it sweeps through voltages. Um, and uh, the other pad is used for sending out little sort of gate triggers. But this one is a continuously variable uh, and hard to control because it's just my meat, human meat finger capacitance here that's uh, changing that and it's a pretty tight uh, range there, so it's hard to dial something specific in. Uh, but that's that's one way to use this is just as a sort of uh, neat VU meter, uh, and it has modes both for uh, teletype and alphabet uh, encoding. And uh, but yeah, going back to the Circuit Playground Express here, you can see all I'm doing is sending a, a sort of a table I created of uh, the 16-bit analog out values uh, or DAC values for this analog out on pin A0, and then it just works its way through those and loops, loops them around. So this one's actually pretty, it's looking pretty good except for just a couple of the Q and the P have some, some tight tolerances on them. I think I have to still tune the trimmer pot a bit to calibrate that better. Uh, but kind of fun, kind of neat. Uh, you could use this sort of thing in any project you want. You could also use this as an inspiration for building a NeoPixel based project. So that's of course much easier to address uh, because we can do it digitally and you can, you can address multiples at once. Here, if we wanted to light up, let's say, a word, we would have to send those very specific voltages really uh, quickly, I think, in order to, to light up uh, a word like you're seeing happen there. So I'm not, I, I don't have a lot of experience doing that. I just got it put together this morning and, uh, and wrote a little bit of code to, to test that out. But that is a super cool uh, Hack Modular Enigma board, Enigma lamp board there. Uh, you can see these, this pair of ICs here, you can build it with them here for alpha, oops, I've just killed my camera again. What's going on camera? There we go. Uh, these ICs, if they're in these positions, it's alphabetical encoding, and here it's the uh, teletype, ITA2 uh, encoding rather. So uh, neat project and uh, a lot of fun to build. For so uh, this is a nice technique I've seen on a lot of circuit boards where just simply having no solder mask uh, gives you this sort of glow through using the fiberglass material. So it's always going to have a little bit of yellow, yellowish greenish tint to it, but in this case it looks really nice. Uh, and this is a little bit bright in camera. It actually is a little darker uh, in the real world. I'm not sure if I can adjust that down a little bit. There we go. A little nicer to look, like, look at there. Uh, and then this just has the input of the voltage coming in, and then I think there's a buffered output, so it should be an exact 
uh, copy of that voltage coming out of here so that it's not sagging, uh, which is bad for music stuff because it means things start to go flat or, or sound weird. So uh, this is meant to be able to just pass through a voltage on its way over to something that's actually making uh, some sound using a volt per octave uh, control on an oscillator, for example. So that's the Enigma lamp board. Uh, and that's my, my last little fun project for me to build for myself of the year. Um, yeah, as, as uh, Liz says, it would be fun to build uh, patches to spell things out, uh, which would be really cool. Uh, let's see, other questions. Uh, the, oh, Kayoshi asks, what was the board I had the SNES controller plugged into? Uh, so this one right here is the uh, Proto Screw Shield Featherwing or Terminal Block Featherwing. I think we call it that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show you right here. Let me bring up the bring up the store. This is Screw Terminal. Feather wing? No. Oops, I didn't spell feather right. Why do I not know this thing's name? <laughs> Proto? No. Screw? Oh, terminal. I think it's terminal block feather wing. Terminal block, assembled terminal block breakout feather wing for all feathers. It's ID 2926, uh, and it comes with uh, screw terminals that break out every single pin on your feather, uh, as well as some uh, extras so you get multiple ground pins on there. Uh, let me show this nice close up, in fact. Uh, so you can, he as you see here, there are some that are standard. So those are on the silk screen. Some can vary based on which feather it is. So those don't have a number, but you can see you get two three volts uh, on one side and another three volt on the other. You get uh, two grounds on one side and another ground or even two on the other, I think. Um, yeah, so this is just a, in fact, I'll, let me show you the uh, down shooter here again. I'll turn this off. So one of the things this has is a, I can get a little closer to it here and refocus. And I'll brighten it up since I'm not pointing it at NeoPixels. Oh, that's not brighter. There we go. There we go. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it off. It has an enable switch right there, so that will, no matter how you're powering your feather here over USB or via battery, that enable switch is a way of essentially powering it down uh, just by, by uh, grounding the enable pin that's on the board. Uh, so that's a nice feature of it. I can pull this feather out. I've got it mounted using some uh, headers. You can also mount to it directly. You get some little bonus proto area here, uh, like any of our terminal uh, uh, doublers and, or our feather doublers and triplers and quadruplers. Uh, and then you can see here, actually, if you look at the reflection on the copper traces under the silk screen, you can see all those feather uh, pins are just sort of fanned out to those terminals. And this will tell you, Again, for some common ones like RXTX, uh, the S, uh, SPI breakouts, the uh, I squared C breakouts, those are standard on all the feathers, so those, those have a silk screen on here. Uh, so these are great, and uh, that's uh, a, a nice way to do something like this uh, wiring for the SNES controller. Uh, also, someone asked about the SNES controller. I'll, I'll jump back here. Uh, for a second, and what do we call it? Gamepad, USB gamepad with accelerometer, that's not it. That's a totally different thing. We probably call it, do we call it SNES? Yeah, we call it SNES controller. Uh, so this one's just $4.95, we have 30 of them in stock right now. Um, and it's, you know, a, a decent clone one. It's not gonna be as, as nice and, and tight to play on as a, uh, 
a first party Nintendo uh, branded one, but you probably don't want to take a Nintendo branded one and dig it open to do a weird project with. So this is a, a, a nice way to have a, uh, excuse me, a low cost SNES controller on hand. Uh, it's also got no branding on it there. So if you want to add your own uh, logo to it, a sticker, do a custom paint job or whatever, these are, these are kind of fun to work with. So. Uh, I don't think, yeah, we don't have a uh, socket to plug that into. It'd be cool if we had a little socket, but I just pop the end off and you're left with the, the five pins that actually, I think, have little crimp headers on them because those, um, those, when they plug into an SNES, NES, there are pins inside of the little barrels. And so uh, you can use those. Uh, let's see, other questions. Someone asked about giant seven segment displays. Yeah, I do have a project. Uh, DJ Devin said there, that I did a seven segment clock. It was the Ninja Timer for uh, American Ninja Warrior um, using NeoPixel strips and, and laser cut acrylics. So you can look for that if that, uh, VJ Pussycat, if that helps with what you're looking for. Um, and. Todd, I'm not going to stick the patch cable on my tongue to see if I can spell things. Although that would be maybe something to practice. <laughs> I don't want to just try it for the first time in front of everybody, you know. Uh, so yeah, that was the question about those. All right, I think that does it. So uh, I will remind you again, you can go and get 10% off in the store if you want to pick up that SNES controller, then it'll cost uh, approximately 49 or 50 cents less. Um, is that right? Is my math right? I don't know if my math's right. I think so. Jazz hands, jazz dash hands. That'll get you 10% off in the store on your way out. Uh, and I will thank everyone so much for coming by and for uh, participating in the community and being here all year. It's been quite a year and we're really looking forward to 2023. Uh, as I said, I'll be doing my product pick show on next Tuesday. Phil Lamore will be back on Wednesday to do show and tell and ask an engineer. Woohoo! And I'll be back on my normal Thursday time to do the John Parks workshop show. So I will see you uh, next week in 2023 for that. Um, and I believe that is going to do it. So thanks everyone for Adafruit Industries. I am John Park. This has been John Parks workshop. And now for your moment of Lars. <laughs> Thank you.